Terry McBride, Network Music Group, Vancouver, Canada, and I believe today is May something, mid-May, 2006. Network Music Group is a record label, publishing company, artist management, design, and it has a sort of internet function to it too. And also merchandising, funny enough. Basically everything that is required to be self-sufficient with inside the music business. The record label came first, started in 1984 in my one bedroom apartment. Um, artist management came second um, when we realized three, four years in that what we were doing was actually artist management. In what respect was that? Well, getting those lazy bands off their butts and on the road touring. That was going to be the only way that the music that we liked and that these artists that we first signed played was going to get heard because surely radio was not going to be a driving force early in their careers. What is artist management? Artist management is inspiring your artists and um, educating your artists to what's out there and how everything works and creating opportunities for them to walk into or walk away from. I think it's good to run a label when it comes to managing artists because it, it, it gives you a view of both sides. Um, a lot of artist managers and artists, um, if they have issues, they usually point at the record label as being the you know, problem. And I think by being on both sides, you tend to take a more balanced view and you tend to bring solutions to the table versus pointing fingers. It's no different except that um, I think being a manager not in a major musical city is probably a better question. In, in essence, by living in Vancouver, um, we stay out of the sort of, um, let's everybody chase the same tail. And we get pers perspective, a very different look. We, we live in a different paradigm. And as such, we view things differently. Mm -hmm. um, I do not want to be in the eye of the storm. Then I've got all these distractions around me. I'd rather be able to be in a quiet spot without having to go out and see 15 shows a week, without having to talk with all of the industry people and just be focused on creating and marketing and um, having or original thought versus having collective thought. There is no school for artist management. You can go to school for the, sort of, for, for the law part of it, for the economics part of it, probably for some of the marketing part of it, for the IT part of it, but what is a manager? A manager is someone who can communicate, is innovative, creative, and has a really good personality. So we hire, firstly, based on personality, because the rest of it can be taught, but personality cannot. You don't need to be sensitive to art. You don't need to be musical, because music's intuitive. What you need to be is honest. You know what? If it's a turd, it's a turd. If you polish it, now it's a polished turd. It's still a turd. A good song is a good song. A great song is, a, is like a bookmark. And you've got to have that honesty. And some of my biggest discussions with my artists is they're set on a certain song being a single. And you're going, it's not a single. And you'll go back and forth for six months. They'll go back, they'll, they'll go back and write a whole pile more songs because they want to say what the single is. And at the end of the day, the song that they thought was the single didn't, doesn't even make the cut because they've written so much better songs. I've seen that happen so many times, it's crazy. But it's honesty. It's the biggest attribute that a manager can have is honesty. Don't play into the ego. Don't help create the ego. I mean, what is ego? Ego is what other people think of you. So in essence, other people are running your life. And if you put it like that to like an artist, they begin to under stand it. So it's not about being yes people, it's about being honest people. I think what makes for longevity in a manager's career is having fun and being inspiring, being creative, um, keeping up on what's happening with the people who buy the music. Not with the industry, but with the fans. Keeping up with the fans. That's really, really crucial. I am hands-on. Um, but the fact that we work in management teams, I think managers can work with five or six different artists. Yet, I think of a manager solo, they, they can't even work with one. It's that 1% that you miss that could be the difference 
It's a myriad of small steps, and maybe it's the one step that you missed by being a solo manager that makes the difference between sec a successful artist and not a successful artist. If you work in teams, chances are you won't miss that because there's more eyeballs and more brain cells being focused upon it, and every little tiny thing gets covered. Um, I mean, I actively work with probably within a one-year time period, maybe two dozen artists. And some of it's very hands-on. Um, some of it's mostly just looking at what's happening. And then if I, if I think of something different, communicating that. Um, it could be helping to create the marketing plan and some of the early thoughts behind it, planting those seeds, and then walking away and just watching. Because you have to, if what you do never, what you never want to do is to own the idea. Um, how do you become a manager? Well, I mean, I think there's many, many ways. I mean, you could start off um, by, you know, at university being, work, working at the local college radio station. Um, communicating with all the record company people who might come in. Communicating with the artists that come in. Communicating with their handlers that might come in with them. Uh, maybe become the local college booker. You know, um, maybe get on the road with like an artist being a guitar tech and then slowly but surely learn these, you know, skills to be a tour manager. I've, I've seen some really good tour managers become really good managers. I mean, my first management experience was going on the road and being a, you know, tour manager and selling merch and some, sometimes doing front of house sound because the band could not afford to hire anybody for it. The manager's free, so the manager went and did it. And, you know, the manager didn't realize that he was being a manager. He was just the record company guy trying to make sure that the band went and toured. So, you know, there's no specific way to basically start because there is no school for this. Um, I think a lot of people fall into it. They fall into it, but they intuitively fall into it. But I, th I think you have to have a love for music. And you have to understand it. You know, not understand it and going, well, that's a hit and that'll sell millions. But to passionately understand how an artist works. To understand what is a song. A song's not a, a shirt. What is a song? It's frozen thoughts. And those frozen thoughts are collected. They create emotions. Those emotions become bookmarks to people's lives. So when you hear that song, you know, Fleetwood Mac or, you know, something from Rumors, you're transported right back to that part in your life and that's a bookmark. Those are the powerful songs. And the ability to be emotionally connected to music in that way is a huge plus for a manager because you can recognize a bookmark when you hear it. You can recognize a turntable hit when you hear it, but when you hear something special, you know it. And you find out a way creatively to make that work. I mean, Sarah McLaughlin's Angel, a first number one hit, was not considered by the record label at the time to be a single. So what we needed to do was to find a vehicle to get it known better. As such, City of Angels, where it was the fourth single from that soundtrack, worked by Warner Brothers, not by BMG. And it became Sarah's first ever number one single. But it was a five minute ballad. And really the song was based on the fact of someone committing suicide. But Sarah writes from a point of view that you don't know that. She writes from the point of view that you make the song your own. So Angel's a very cathartic song that is used in so many uses by so many people to convey so much feeling. And it's those frozen thoughts that she created which are transparent and transferable. And a manager's ability to intuitively know it when you hear it is probably the most powerful thing, that, 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 that most powerful tool that a manager has. Talent to me is always intuitive. I mean, if you, if you think of the Two of the biggest signings that we've done being Avril Lavigne and Sarah McLachlan. They were both signed without having written a song. So it's meeting them, it's hearing them sing, and it's intuitively knowing that they've got it. And then creating the environment for them to be able to create it. Well, Avril came via a VHS tape of her doing karaoke in her parents' basement. And she covered three, four songs, um, two of them by artists that we represented, um, one being Sixpence Down the Richer with a song called Kiss Me. And then she also covered Sarah McLaughlin's Adia. And in, Sarah McLaugh in Adia, Sarah bends her notes, so she bends octaves. 
And so trying to do karaoke to that song is really difficult because usually you go out of tune. Um, Avril nailed it. Purely based on seeing that karaoke tape, we sent her down to New York to work with one of our Mixer Pro producers at the light time, who's also a songwriter and had a um, studio. Um, shortly after they started work, um, one of the LA Reads A&R people heard some of the tracks. LA had her in. She sang for LA. Um, LA wanted to um, sign her. We had a demo deal with her. We ripped it up and we walked away so that she could go down that road. We were not management then. I was not going to stop her from following her own dream. When her and her manager parted ways about nine months later, the record company um, sent out some of the earlier songs to about a, a, a dozen or two dozen man you know, managers, us being one of them, not knowing the history behind it. Listened to four songs, went, okay, well, there's three number one singles. Went, damn, we should have kept that one, but it was the right thing to do. Um, expressed our interest. We were the last management company for um, Av and her mom to meet with. They came out, spent the day with us. The following morning came, came in and asked us to be the, art, the artist management because they were able to get a clear story about why we did what we did in order to allow her to follow her dream. And the rest is, you know, 25 million albums, you know, two albums, 25 million sold. There you go. Yes, we represent a number of high-profile Canadian artists, but we also represent number of high-profile UK artists and US artists. Um, I think Canadians being sort of the, you know, the sort of the northern state of like America, um, with English being the sort of predominant language, there's no issue for, you know, Canadians going into America and vice versa. And, you know, being part of the Commonwealth, there's, there's, there's no issues for, you know, Canadians working in England either. So I think it's been a really good place to sort of grow up because you're, you know, affected by both English, English culture and you're affected by American culture. So you get a really good balance. Like British bands tend to break in Canada first and break in the U.S. second. So it's been a really good balance. But, um, and, you know, Canadians are less political. I think just quieter and, and like some way more, you know, sort of thoughtful culture um, are, you know, passions don't rise to the like top, except maybe in hockey. So, you know, um, our politics is nice. And so there, there's, a, there's a lot of things about Canadian culture, I think, that is more left-leaning and more, you know, liberal and less rhetorical in, in like its nature. I would prefer not to be in the same city that my artists are. There's only one artist that we represent that lives in Vancouver, that's Sarah McLaughlin. Um, every other artist doesn't, and that's a godsend. Otherwise, they'd be in here, hanging out on this couch, talking. Now, how am I supposed to be out there doing what I'm supposed to be doing on their behalf if all I'm doing is talking to them? So, you know, I'm very much about the philosophy that I do not need to hang out with my artists. I need to communicate with my artists, and in this age, that's really quite easy. Uh, via I am or email or phone or text, it's really easy to be in constant communication with them. There's not one day that goes by when I don't communicate with almost everyone in some means. Well, there's all these divisions, but in fact that's purely for the accountants and for avoiding taxes for as long as we can so that we can use that capital effectively um, within. It's purely titles because the way that network works is we have all of the management clients, all of the record company clients, and then we have three marketing teams. And those three marketing teams have everything that a marketing team needs from the IT person to the, to the print and digital design people to the three or four internet marketing people to a traditional marketing people to sales to radio to publicity. Each sits in a team. So those teams don't need to go outside of themselves to get anything done from start to end. So we have three of these teams, and we have one in Europe. So we actually have four. And we've taken the whole roster, the management roster and the record label roster, and we've matched it, blended it, and broken it up into three. So the same team that might be working in Avril Lavigne is also working a bluegrass band called Old Crow Medicine Show. So in essence, there is no division. The, the industry thinks there is, 
But these marketing teams market small things and huge things, major label things and artist imprint things. They market everything and they share ideas collectively. We'll take all of the internet marketing people, send them to New York for like a weekend. They stay up till five in the morning. They bond, they share the ideas that, are, that they're having a lot of fun with and that, that spreads throughout the whole company. We don't have marketing meetings. Marketing, you've got a good idea, get out of your desk, go into the hallway and yell it out. If you've got a good idea, talk about it. Don't sit in your office. If you notice here, and if you go to our New York office and our new LA office, it's all open environment. There's no closed office. Every office, the doors are glass. And there's no offices on the inside. Only offices around the perimeter. It's an open, creative environment. I want people to be blasting music, I want them to be communicating and having fun and sharing ideas. My day to day is usually wake up 6, 6.30, watch the you know, sun come up, um, go come into the office, get rid of a lot of my early emails, then I'll go play tennis. You know, that's if I'm here in Vancouver, which is two weeks out of every month. I'll come back here around about nine quarter after. I'll work throughout the day. I have a list of you know, things that um, I have to get done on my sort of to-do list, and I have my schedule for the day, and I try and match the two. But what I try and do is keep my doors open the whole day. And what I've got to do, I, I sort of focus on, but there's so many things that come at me. Um, in the way of, you know, I have two screens on my, on my desk. One is nothing but IMs, instant messaging conversations. So I have about 30 conversations all going on at the same time. But the really cool thing about, about, about that is I can join conversations, I can combine conversations, I can video conference with people quickly, um, all while I'm doing a bunch of other stuff. So I'm multitasking throughout the whole day, but all I'm really doing is acting as a conduit of ideas from one project to another or like vice versa. Like today we had a leak on the, you know, on the format record, which is not coming out for eight, for eight more weeks. Tom, their day-to-day -day manager, just arrived in you know uh, London, so he needs me to, to hop on and help get some things going for him. That's who he asked. So I phone up Nate and Sam. We have a little conversation. Nate's writing a post to put on put on their their street team site. We get the rest of the marketing crew ready. We're launching the album digitally tonight. So it's that's a normal day. Maybe I'm IMing with Steve Schnur from Electronic Arts, sending him a brand new Bare Naked Ladies mix, and him going, oh my god, this is like great. And I, and I know probably in like a week now, he'll, he'll like come back and go, can I put this in like this game? So it's, it's, it's all about that. It's just being a conduit for what's happening. And if I got a great idea, I write it down, and I'll either e, I'll email it the minute that I think of it, or I'll IM it, or if it's late at night, I'll just text it. So it's out of my head to the person just planting that seed with that, with that other you know, uh, manager and then allowing them to take it and shape it with the artist. So it's coming from the artist, it's not coming from me. And that's where I mean where you spend time getting an artist's ego not to develop, you gotta make sure that the manager's ego does not develop and that you, you keep creative and fun. Anybody from this office, no matter what their position is, can walk in here whenever they want and talk to me about whatever is on their mind. CEO is a pain in the ass title, but I gotta have it for corporate papers. And I gotta have it for the rest of the industry so that they know who I am. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's a completely useless title. The new paradigm in the music business. I, I call it collapse in copyright. So, where we're moving is, you know, you have the master copyright, you have the publishing copyright, then you have the likeness of the artist. Usually those three pieces are owned by three different entities. And that's a deterrent to the actual copyright. Because usually if one wants to give it away free, the other two don't. Um, it's very rare that all three parties say yes and something moves, you know, um, forward. So if you collapse that copyright, and all of a sudden the master the publishing and the likeness all sit in one place, then you can maximize that copyright. You can get creative. You can, you can, let's say, give away a song to create revenue on the live side. 
You can give away a song to um, create publishing revenue. You can let go of the publishing to create a master revenue. You can do many different things with it. Um, and that maximizes that copyright versus having it split and fractured. You've got three different parties wanting the same remuneration from it, which in many ways halts certain things from actually happening. So where we're moving is to try and get all of our artists to own intellectual property, to have control, creative control over their intellectual property. And in doing so, they'll actually have more value associated to that copyright. Uh, a, a case in example, the Bear and Air Naked Ladies haven't released a studio album in three years. They finished up their, the Warner you know, Brothers deal. They did a Christmas album. Christmas album sells 400, you know, 400,000 copies. The band walks out with $3.6 million in revenue because of collapsed copyrights. We're on a major label system that would have garnered maybe a half million dollars worth of revenue for them. Now they've got a new album. I'm only using the word album because people need to have some context to it. It's a collection of 29 songs. But it's also a collection of 100 masters of those 29 songs. Live versions, acoustic versions, master tones, the studio versions, alternative studio versions. So our whole philosophy is with a collapsed copyright, that allows you to go out and rather than telling the fan or the consumer how to consume your music, you allow them to tell you. You, you allow them to purchase it any way that they want, however they want, wherever they want, and whenever they, they want. Where right now we tell them you must buy it on this shiny piece of plastic and you can have 12 songs. And you gotta go to a store, you have to do this to actually get it. Or you gotta go to iTunes and you can only make five copies of it. My whole thing is, that's like telling you to go down to the center of town, fill up your eight gallon jug of water, take it back to your place, and that's your shower water. That's how the music industry, industry treats, treats people. We tell them how to consume. So in the new paradigm, we don't. We put it everywhere that the consumer is and allow them to decide how they're going to consume it. So with the Bare Naked Ladies album, it's coming out in, sep in September. We started selling 21 of those 28 songs in December of last year. The band played one song a night on their Christmas tour. If you go and you buy those concerts, there's a new song every night. And you don't need to buy the whole concert, you can buy the song a la carte. So we're not telling you how you have to do it. And there's a lot of people who have found out about it and have already, have already been purchasing these new masters. Now when we release it, we're, we're like going to have every different variation that one could think of. The industry is going to look at this and go, well, you know, they only sold like three, four hundred thousand CDs while the last one did a million. And I'm going to go, that's correct. But we probably sold two or three million masters. And what you're missing is you're stuck in this perception of a per unit based on a piece of plastic. I'm more interested in allowing fans to, con to consume the music the way that they want to. So I've moved out of the per you know, unit way of looking at the world. And I've moved in, in into maximizing the brand, maximizing the copyrights by giving the fans what they, you know, what they want and letting them choose, not me choosing for them. So the Bare Naked Ladies will have a very successful record, but the industry will not know what to make of it. But you think they really care? It's, it's ironic that, they, that when, they, when they started their, indie, their independent record label four years ago, they called it Desperation Records because there's nothing desperate about it now. And they're actually really quite happy about it. But that's an example of the new paradigm. This company started really, really simply. Imagine releasing the music that you like. Now that sounds like a very simple, maybe a bit contrived, but what is imagination? Imagination allows you to see the end. Not to see the process, but to see the end. So imagine releasing music you like. So you already know the end, and you work your way backwards. When you do that, you follow your dream, because you're actually following it home. You're not moving to it, you're moving back from it. Imagination is a very powerful thing. Imagination was how this company started. Imagination was how Lilith Fair started. Imagination was how this whole new artist paradigm is starting. You know, imagine the ability to sell your music directly to your fans the way that they want it. Whether it's at physical retail with a CD, 
whether it's band to fan, you know, the old Grateful Dead model, but brought to, to like this decade, whether it's iTunes, Rhapsody, eMusic, however they want it, allow them to decide. But imagine that. So the, the very simple thought behind making the Bare Naked Ladies step away from the major label paradigm was imagine yourself as a music fan and how the music that, that you like, you're limited to how you have access to it. So imagine the ability to allow the, the fan to be right next to you. And let's think about that and imagine that and then let's figure out going backwards since we believe that, that's, that that is the future. Let's go backwards now and figure out how to actually do it. And that's that step of imagination. Confidence can be viewed as having blinders on. Um, I delete the negative. I delete the doubt. There's all these people that doubt what we're doing. They've been doubting what, you know, what we've been doing for 20 years. There's people that would tell me right to my face, oh, the network's gonna be dead in like three years when we like first started that one. Great, might be dead for you, it's not dead for me. It's, it's deleting that doubt. And it's, the, and it's the realization that you can manifest your own destiny and having confidence in your own intuitive senses. The only time that we've made missteps is when we allowed outside noise or the Velcro effect to make us change direction slightly. Whether it's with a, the first single, or whether it's with anything that we've basically done. Whenever we've gone with our gut, with our intuition, for whatever reason, it's worked. And so that gives us whatever confidence we need to follow our own road. Again, manifest your own destiny. Was it Ramadas who said, be here now? You can't affect the past. You cannot be in the future, but you can be here now and you can create your future. So don't worry about the past. Don't get caught up in the drama of what went wrong. Because what's that gonna accomplish? Nothing. I think, I think the key to being a successful artist is to be true to yourself and not be something that you're not. So if you get up in the morning and you dress a certain way to go get your groceries, that's how you should dress in, your, in like your rock video. That's how you should dress when you're, on, uh, when you're on stage. Just be you. I think you see so many artists that are pimped up or dressed and made to look unnatural. And I think a lot of people look at that and go, well, I like the music. They're a star, but I can't be them. I can't touch them. Sarah McLaughlin, Avril Lavigne, Adido, Nicole Play. You can touch them. They're, they look the way that you look. Yes, they might be stars, but they're not differentiating themselves from anybody else except through their music and through their actions. So they're not made up, they're real people. If you ran into Sarah, you'd be quite, su be quite surprised that she looks normal. Avril looks normal. Just be yourself. I think the diversifications work to our advantage, but I can't say that we thought 10 years ago, like let's imagine diversifying what we do. Um, all of the elements of network were built on commonsensical situations and, and like thought process. Um, the creation of AMP, which is the merchandising company, happened because we did a one-off Lilith Fair show in Florida and the merchandise for that show arrived the day after. So we realized that we could never allow that to happen because the amount of stress that that added to us that day was not even worth the amount of money lost. It wasn't. Like, to have that stress and just be caught up in that, completely ruined that show for us. So we realized we can't allow that to happen again. So we started the merchandising company. Publishing was, in the early days, nobody wanted to publish our artists. And if there was mechanicals being um, created and performance happening upon radio and uh, other income, it had to be collected some, you know, somehow. So we just created the publishing company. Management, in over like time, we created the management company because we realized that we were doing management. So it's all commonsensical. Nothing was done 
with some grand vision. It was all based upon what made sense. And being able to control our own destiny. Now that doesn't mean that, that every artist use every, uses every function of network. The last thing I want an artist to have to do is have to use every, you know, er, you know, everything. They, what they do get to do is pick and choose within the infrastructure of what they want to use and what they don't want to use. Like if in, in the case of a, an Othello or format, um, if they already, or Guster, they already have their own fan clubs going. They already have their own merchandise and, you know, f filming going. Great. You know, what, what, what they might not have going is, is all these sort of digital stuff along with all the backend and the servers and the PayPal and Visa transactions. So they, would, they will do all the physical and we'll do all the digital, but it all goes through their websites, not through our websites. So again, pick and choose from within inside the infrastructure, but the infrastructure has been built so that you don't have to go out to go outside, but it doesn't stop you from going out, you know, outside. This is not about us wanting to do everything. It's about we have all of these services, pick and choose what you want to use. Um, but we obviously feel that, that, what, that what we have to offer is better than what's on the outside. But you can't persuade an artist till they actually learn. That's an ongoing process. Um, I mean, it usually starts with music. I mean, they wouldn't be sitting on this couch unless I really truly believe that what they're singing about, they actually are. Um, there's got to be that connect. There's got to be that reality. There's got to be that sort of realism about, about, about everything about it. And they've got to have that cause. They've, 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 they've got to have that passion. If they don't have that, if all they want to do is be rock and roll stars for the sex, the drugs, and the rock and roll, I'm like, cool, see ya. Not interested. Don't buy into that. Artists should always know about the business. This is their career. It's not my career. It's their career. We're partners in this, and part of my role is to educate. It's like to educate. I mean, I can remember telling Avril's mom and even Sarah's parents that just because your daughter is not going to finish high school or is not going to be in uni you know, university doesn't mean that their education stops. It says they're going to get a really good education on how the real world works. And you know, the first year, year and a half of like Avril was educating her to why she was doing what she was doing. So if you're going to go into Denver and do four radio stations and maybe this event or that event, you want to explain to your artist why, the impact it has, and all of the politics around it so that they understand it. And the more that they understand, then when they have to make de decisions, the decisions are very sound ones because they're based on having some premise to it. I'm happy I'm having fun. Do I have a career? I honestly don't know. I mean, I don't see it that way. It's if, it, if this stops being fun and I stop laughing and I stop being creative and happy, I will go do something else and I'll have no issue doing it. But this is way too much fun. This, I don't come to work. I come to a place where there's a lot of people who I really love and we have a great time together. There's a lot of laughter in this place and that's what it should be. So if this is a you know, career or the definition of a you know, career, I'm quite happy with that.